Fine, keep going. And just when you're finished, sort of fold it in half and just pass it along the aisle. And if gradually over the course of the lecture they could just sort of accumulate on the floor of the aisle here, if you could just pass them along. No, don't make paper aeroplanes out of them. That, that would be bad. Uh, you know, nasty paper aeroplane accident. <laughs> um, if I could make it uh, to the middle here, th then that's cool. Then I could just grab them all at the end. Yeah. I, it's best if they're anonymous at this stage. Yeah, but like, what if it's really big? He doesn't read his emails anyway. So oh, yeah, I'm not reading email at the moment. Oh, I should mention that, by the way. Have you, I don't know if you noticed, I've got this bit of a sling. I actually, uh, it's too painful for me to type at the moment. And I keep sitting down and starting to type, and then I go, ah! So I have to put my, I actually lash myself up so I can't type, and I'm trying to learn how to type left handed. Uh, because, yeah, my shoulder's been hurting a lot over the last couple of weeks. And after I talked about uh, RSI the other day, I thought, oh my God. I wonder if that's what it was, but it wasn't in my hands, so I was assuming. But it's actually been so, you might have noticed I haven't done much coding for quite a while. I'm mainly talking, not doing much coding. I'm, I'm not, actually not able to type. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so I'm not reading email at the moment. I, I'm finding it very, I'm, anything I can click on with a mouse, I'm doing, but typing is extremely difficult. So, sadly for me, I have a player, a perfect player in my mind, and I haven't been able to type it in. But if I get it, my player written, I will post, I don't know if anyone's still interested now. Can I tell you about my beautiful player? Yes. I just very quickly, um, my beautiful player works like this. I, I looked at the rules of the game and thought, oh, I love this game when I used to play it as a boy, but I haven't played this game for so long, I can't remember what's good strategy and bad strategy other than vaguely, except I remember there is a lot of strategy in it. And I thought, I could sit down and work out all these elaborate strategies and all sorts of stuff like that, but that's very time consuming. And that's a sort of moronic thing to do. And who's good at doing time consuming moronic things? The computer. So all my strategy does, all my player does is it, um, it Every time it's going to make a move, it just simulates a thousand games after having made that move to see who wins. And it yeah. works out the percentage of people that win and lose. Yeah, in one, one second, it's C, one second, I can do a million things in one second. So the trick is I have to make my game simulator very fast. So, I, so it has to be, it's a very simple hand and strategy for doing simulation so I can do bulk moves lightning fast because I need you to be able to do thousands and thousands and thousands of simulations. Plus I pre-compute a whole lot of probabilities about card distributions, which I've done already and I've put it on a spreadsheet and I've done an analysis of variance and a chi-square test and all sorts of things and I've come up with all the probability distributions of the card so I can generate random decks really fast and allocate them to people really quickly. And then I just have to play the game. And so all, it's just the most stupid strategy in the world. It just says, oh, what would happen if I played this? We'll play an enormous million number of games. Oh, look, I won 12% of them. What would happen if I did this? How about that? It's really cool. It's very, very simple, but I just can't type the damn thing in. But I will. I will get it typed in. I'm, I'm slowly learning how to type with my left hand. Okay, so now what I want to talk about is the exam. First of all, for the exam is... Uh, ah, left, I'm going to use my right hand, and this will just cause me a lot of pain later on. Uh, it's interesting actually, my complete lack of self-control. If I don't tie my hand up, uh, after a few seconds on the computer, my right hand's out and I'm typing with it. Just uh, human nature, eh? It's terrible. So do follow my advice about oh and and I wish I had now. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to look there. Okay. Um, that is a scary photo I took on my laptop one day because the dean needed a photo of me. And she was, she was saying, hurry up, we need a photo for something. And I said, I don't have a photo of me. And she said, I need a photo, I need a photo. And I said, oh, my new Mac takes photos. I went, click. And this is photo of me going. <laughs> so then, oh, I forgot to bring my uh, Marvin. Uh, come with me afterwards. Uh, up to my office, I will give you Marvin because you deserve Marvin for being this. You remember the alien? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so exam, are we looking at that? Yes. The easiest thing about the exam is there is a sample exam here already. There's the exam that was used in 2006. It's really close to the final exam. I've written the exam on paper, by the way. I've drawn, I just can't type it in at the moment. Um, so I was looking at it last night, and I've got a summary of all the things that are in it and the rough proportions of marks for various things. But when I've typed it up, it will change a little bit because I know it'll just look a bit too long and some questions will come out and I'll have to jiggle marks around. So I can't make any utter guarantees about what's in it, but I can certainly give fairly confident, you know, roundabout ones. I can't say 12% of the marks are on trees or something, but I can say, oh, yeah, 
a bit more than 10% of the marks involve trees or something. I can say things like that. This exam here is a great example of an exam and it has all the exam rules in it. So let's go and look at this exam. You can see this from our course homepage. Maybe I should just go to the homepage. Has everyone seen it? It's just there. It's been there the whole... How do I get to the top? Course homepage. It's just here. Exam. The sample exam I used two years ago and the actual exam I used two years ago. Let's look at the actual exam. This is the one you should look at. Oh, they're both fine. So your exam will look a lot like this. Oh, yeah, I lied about the names of the... We put little silly stuff on the exam. Ignore everything that looks silly. Uh, uh, now... This one had a whole lot of multiple choice. The new exam probably won't have any multiple choice. Um, but no, but it'll have the same questions. So it just probably won't be a multiple choice format. The same sort of question. So look at this. There's questions about style, questions about types, questions about evaluating expressions, um, questions about strings, a question about... OK, you've got to trace the program through. We like you being able to trace programs. You could probably already do that. So you, the program runs, and you have to work out what value it has at the end. Can the style guide page go in the printout? You can put whatever you want in your... Yeah, it's in the wiki, though. In the nice notes. Yes, what's going to happen with the nice notes? Let's take a little pause and talk about the nice notes. I will create a root thing for the nice notes, which says all the nice notes. Um, it's probably just going to be a category page. It's category nice notes. It searches for nice notes, category nice notes. And then you guys can put whatever you want in the nice notes, except if they're too big, I'll edit them down to the right size. So your rough rule of thumb is try and make it no more than five pages a week, and you can put up to ten other pages in, I think I said. So, yeah, you can embed style. You can embed whatever you want in the nice notes. Yes? Yeah, I've been working on them in two weeks. Good man. And yes. the other ones have to be condensed tape, so is it fine if I just delete crap that we don't need? Yeah, you just edit and, and edit and work on it and delete, and yeah, you could... Um, you could start a little discussion page, first of all, underneath, like slash discuss, saying, here's what I propose to do. Does anyone have any objections? And wait a day or two. But we don't lose any revisions of anything. So if you can go through cleaning them up, the, the words in there don't belong to anyone. Someone's written them already starting it off. But the idea of a wiki is that everyone that comes along can touch them and make them better. And you own the copyright. And who owns the copyright? We all own the The uni owns the copyright. I don't know who owns the copyright. <laughs> no one owns the copyright. You can write some book later on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are making it into a book, and we're giving it all to you. Okay, so the idea is that's what's happening in the exam. We're printing it out and giving it to you. And that is your course textbook. So I want it to sort of look nice. Shh, shh, shh. But the idea is, yeah, so don't just change anything you want and just make it look clearer if it's not clear. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. What we don't want to get is in a war with one person thinking this way is clear and them oscillating between the changes. If that ever starts happening, open a discuss page and sort it out underneath. But hopefully every change is improving it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want the nice notes when printed out to be a nice textbook so that at the end... You'll have a little book summarising everything you learned in the course. So this is how a tree works. This is how this works. This is how this works. This is how C works. This is a common mistake we can make. There's all these hands up. Maybe I'll do that before we go through the exam. Yeah? You can put C code in, sure. What you, the only thing really you shouldn't put in the nice notes is don't just get all the lab solutions and stick them in thinking, oh, I wonder if there'll be a lab question in the exam. Because that's a hopeless textbook. You know, if you opened up a book and it just had a whole lot of code. But if you said, here's a problem, how would you solve it or something, then put it, it's just got to look a bit like a reasonable book. So someone not doing the exam can pick it up and go, oh, yeah, I see. This is what we did that year. We don't want it to be worthless the second the exam's finished. We want you to be able to keep it on your shelf and go back and flip through it. Yeah. Yes. Did you have a question? No, stretching. Behind you. Alex. Danny. Ah! Ah! <laughs> uh. <laughs> Is there a solution to the past paper? No, I don't think there are, are there? Oh, yeah, you can do that, sure, if you want. But don't just put solutions to past exams. Put a question yeah, and, and have a reason for putting the question in. So if you're talking about trees, say, for example, here's some code to do something to a tree. Or, yeah. So the, it shouldn't just be questions and answers. That's not what we're thinking it is. It's not supposed to be like a cheat sheet. It's supposed to be a book explaining stuff. Does that make, all make sense? So at the last minute, I'll go through sort of editing it. So if it's just jammed full of a whole lot of answers, they might just disappear or something if there's no reason for them being in there. So, so don't just jam answers. But no one's going to. Why are we even talking about this? We're wasting time. Yes? Could we have examples like, um, this is how you do a bubble sort and then have like a bit of code? Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's great. How can you describe bubble sort without a bit of code? Bubble sort is a sorting algorithm that works like this. Here's an implementation. Yeah, perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And that would be a really nice thing to have in your little textbook. Let's look through the code here. Here we go. Uh, so that's a tracing question. Here's something using structs and pointers. 
Ah, yeah, here's a fun one. This is just testing if you remember when to use an arrow and when to use a dot. These are all simple ones. They're five markers or three markers or something like that. Are they one mark? I don't believe it. Uh, what's this question about? It's another tracing question, maybe with some subtlety. Oh, this is a debugging one. What happens when this runs? Hey, you guys look at it. Can you see? What happened? Don't call out the answer, but can anyone see? There's a bug in the program. The correct answer to this is... The correct answer to this is E, I believe, none of the above. And this is the mistake here. Oh, no, it's not E, none of the others. What is, uh, flag, it's, oh, we'll always print out false. Yeah, we'll always print out false. That's right. <laughs> now, what you need to know, this is one of the topics that we have in the exam, is common errors. So over the course of the exam, I've mentioned uh, the course at several times I've said, oh, this is a common mistake you'll make, this is a common mistake, this is a common mistake. And then when you've been writing programs, you've been hopefully making these common mistakes and getting to know them. So a legitimate thing for me to do in the exam is to put up some code with common mistakes in it. Now this is a bit mean and diabolical, and I must say, not many people got that one out. Most people didn't realise that I was sneaking them with a nasty little trick. Yes? Can we have some relevant man pages in the book as well? You can put whatever in the textbook is helpful to the textbook. You'll have to work out how to do it. You can do whatever you want. D don't ask me. The answer to everything is yes. 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 We have the, we have the exam. In the <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. That's how the crypto exam runs. The students come in and I say, okay, guys. Yeah. Those, those of you who haven't yet submitted the answers, hurry up. Okay. Shh, 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 shh. Uh, sort algorithm. So there's multiple choice. Um, then there's four sections to the exam. Shh, shh, shh. I, guys, please be quiet. I want to tell you about the, four, the structure of the exam. Here are the exam rules. I did flip over them before, but I realize there's some important stuff to tell you about them. You have to hand in the whole exam paper. Uh, there is no information sheet, and you get to keep it. And you have to hand in the, all the answer booklets. And if you keep any of that stuff, you... Look what happens. You get zero for the exam and a possible charge of academic misconduct. Because we don't want anyone smuggling the exam questions out because there's normally one or two people that still have to do the exam over a short period soon after. Now, I will publish the exam, so I never keep anything secret. So there's no need to smuggle them out unless you're trying to help someone who's not. So we don't let you, so you're getting to take a book in and take the book out. So I guess we'll have to put something on saying there's no, not to be any writing in the book or something like that. But just pay close attention to that. Ensure that you fill in all the details in the front of the sheet, the pink paper, the three answer booklets, and then sign everything. Mark one booklet this, that, 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 okay? And one booklet working only. Oh yeah, we have a working only booklet that we don't mark, but you still hand back. So if you just want to do working and rough working, you get that. But you do hand it in, because we go and look at that if there's a problem sometimes. But we're officially not marking that, so you're not officially getting credit for anything in there. Do not use red pen or pencil in the exam. This is all boring, isn't it? You're tuning out. Don't miss the very last little bit. Don't use, Don't use red pen or pencil in the exam. Yes, you use red chalk. Unless advised otherwise, you may not use any language features or library functions not covered in class. Answers which do not comply with the course style guide or which introduce potential security vulnerabilities will be penalised. There are two marks for following the examination instructions. <laughs> oh, that woke you up. <laughs> okay, so here's the idea. I noticed over years and years and years of setting exams, that when I'm marking 200 exam papers, say we've got 240, but we'll have a bit less than that, but suppose we had 240 exam papers, then for every minute I spend marking, that's how many hours? Four hours. So if a question takes me an extra minute, that's an extra four hours. Now what normally happens is we're very, very careful with exam papers and we sort them into bundles, we cross-check them, we countersign them. As I'm uncoding everyone's sheets and unwrapping all the bundles of papers, we check that everything matches and everything's labelled correctly, because it can't go that once everything gets merged into the system, there's an exam booklet floating around with no one's name on it, for example. That's no good. Or then you could later on claim, oh, but I put in a Part D. And I'll say, I never marked a Part D for you. And then, no, oh, no, So we actually, at the time of unmarked, wrapping everything, we note what every student's handed in. And if someone doesn't hand in a Part D, we write no Part D handed in on the sheet, and we get another person over to check it. And think. So we're really scrupulously care, careful. If you hand in some booklets and you don't write what part, which one's Part D and which one's Part C and which one's Part B, 
not only might we get our counting wrong, so we'd have to open it up and check by hand, but when we distribute them to people to mark, because maybe one person's marking B and one person's marking C, and we're all doing it in a rush, because the uni, God bless their soul, gives us about three and a half minutes to mark all the exam papers. So in the period that I've got to mark them, I'm not going to be sleeping or going to the toilet or anything. It's just 24 hours a day, eyes open, just marking, marking, marking like a madman. And then into uni and scaling and typing and typing and typing. And typing. <sighs> Finally getting to the deadline. It's this horrible frenetic time for me to get it in. Now, if I'm reading the exam booklet and there's no part B, then I have to note I didn't get a part B if I'm marking the Bs. And then if Rupert's got the part Cs, not that he will because he's a student, we don't get students to mark exam papers, but hypothetically suppose Rupert had the part Cs, he might have your part B instead and then we have to ring each other up and drive to each other's place and swap them around and then remember to reintegrate and something's going to fall out. Ah. So it turns out that if anyone doesn't follow the instructions, it just causes this small trail of devastation. Now, it's only a small trail. It might take us an extra five or ten minutes or a real catastrophe and something goes wrong and there's a car trip. It might take us half an hour. But in a course of 200 people, I was finding back in the 90s that I would get like 30 or 40 percent of people not following exam instructions. Because why should you? You know, it's an exam. You're in a rush. You know, why should I label every booklet? They can work that out. I'm going to write my name but not my student number. That's just, who cares whether we... So why would you? There's absolutely no reason for you to do it. But it could cause devastation on our end. I thought, gee, our, our, our aims aren't aligned. My objectives and yours are different. Your objective is to write as much as you can and do as little writing on the front of the exam booklet. Or, or it says write a new question on every page. But who cares? Why would you? You start writing a question, it's on the same page as a question you've already started to answer. Do you think, oh, I'm going to scribble this out and start again? No, you think, oh, they'll sort that out. Which is a devastation if I'm marking one bit and you're marking, you know, uh, sorry, I'm marking one page and you're marking the next page and they're on the same page. That's really, it's actually really hard to pass exam papers between us. If, so anyway, shh, 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 shh. for all these reasons, I realized quite legitimately students weren't following the exam instructions. And it was causing all this devastation, which meant during this time tight time, most of my, or an enormous amount of my time was spent dealing with students administratively, rather than putting all my effort into marking their exam papers, where I want to be looking to see this answer is wrong, but did it have a good idea in it? I want to be thinking about that one. All my time free to do good academic stuff, not administration stuff. So I thought what we have to do is get our interests to align. So this is why we say there's two marks for following the instructions. I want you to think of the instructions as like the spec. You've got to comply with the spec. That's part of being an engineer. If you don't comply with the spec, you lose two marks. Now I don't care because if the, you don't write part D on the booklet or you, don't put the, you write your answer in pencil and no one can read it and we have to get special lights in or something like that, we, we don't mind. We mark it happily and we put a cross on the front of the booklet and that means dock two marks off. Does, does that make sense? And now we think that's a fairer thing. So the student made a strategic mark based sort of decision and we don't mind. So it's, it just sort of just, it makes all the markers sort of feel that's okay, everything's all right. And lo and behold, everyone follows exam instructions now. So this is, I put, the cross goes in here if you didn't follow instructions. Does that make sense? So the, this is why we publish the exam in advance. You can see all the instructions before you walk into the exam. At least a day or two before the exam, I will publish the whole exam with questions removed. So you can see every single instruction. But it's going to look more or less the same as this. Unusual instructions are, if it says write it in the booklet, write it in the booklet. If it says write it on the exam paper, write it on the exam paper. Make sure you get that one right. Number two. Normally we get you to write a lot on the exam paper because then it saves us wasting paper. We can just mark the paper. Part B, write it on the pink question. Do not put the answers in an answer booklet. Da -da 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 -da. Write your answers neatly. Keep them neat and brief. Messy or long answers will not be marked. We just want short answers. Sometimes people get all excited in exams and write huge long answers. If we say what's abstraction, we're computer scientists. We're not English people. We don't want an essay or a sonnet. We just want you to say what abstraction is. And if you can say it in two words, that's great. If you take 10 words, oh, right, but don't take nine pages to tell us what abstraction is. That's expansion. That's not abstraction. So, some, so we're only expecting short ones. So sometimes we put lines in to let you know how much writing we're expecting. You can use more if you want, but that's what we're expecting. How would, how would a drawing to answer that question be uh, received? How would what? A drawing. Whatever, whatever. If there's space for a drawing, you put a drawing in, that's, that's fine. We just, we really... Caring that you can answer the question, not that the format looks exactly right. But we are caring that you follow the instructions. All right, so there's more codes. This is part B. So normally here's how it goes. Part A, I can tell you how this exam is structured. Part A is general sort of question stuff, where we're asking you about stuff that's not necessarily related to programming and where you get to write words. So the part A part of this exam, you'll be writing words. And it's worth something like, oh, if I can remember it, I think it's worth 35% of the exam. 
is part A. The exam is going to last 180 minutes. So basic exam technique, what, what is the, the ratio you calculate before you walk into the exam? Minutes per mark. You guys have not been at uni before, but the magic number for minutes per mark is Tim. How many minutes do you spend per mark? 1.8. 1 1.8? 1 no! That's for the HSC. No, it's 1.5. When did they change it? No, no, you do 1.5 and that gives you time at the end to, to recover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you see a three mark question, you straight away know five minutes. And if, I, I want you to look at a three mark question. I want you to know that's a five minute question. If you're writing for six minutes on that question, you are stealing marks from other questions. And that extra minute of writing is going to get you no extra marks, I guarantee. Or it might move you from 3.5 to 3.6. And you're losing a minute on another question where that extra minute might make a huge difference. So if you see a 10 mark question, how many minutes are you spending on it? 15. 15. Are you spending more than 15? No. no. You're talking to a man who's done actuarial exams where they just fail you for sneezing. I can tell you, <laughs> as soon as you see a question, I write, I have two coloured pens in the exam. When I see 10 minutes, I write down next to it the time that question has to be finished by. So, boom, 9.27. And I've got a big clock on my desk, and I'm going, 9.27, I'm stopping that question, I'm moving on. Don't fall into the trap of thinking, oh, just one more minute, I've nearly got there. No, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> what, if it's a line, it's not a line, no, no. If it's a line, then when you're 30 seconds out, quickly write that line, okay? But move on, that's what I do. That's, that's, well, you don't have to do it, you do it however you want, but I reckon 1.5 minutes a mark. So part A is 35% of the exam, 35 marks. Sorry, the whole exam adds up to more than 100, you can probably guess that. So it goes roughly 35 for part A, 30 for part B, 25 for part C, and 20 for part D. What does that up to? If I'd done it right, it's 110. So 110? The whole exam is out of $110. <laughs> but I tend not to scale it. I tend just to let the mark go in as it is. I'll truncate it if you've done... No, I probably don't even truncate it, because it gets combined with other marks, doesn't it, later on. So, so the exam's out of 110, part A, and it's roughly an increasing order of difficulty. Exam technique again, which part of the exam do you do first? D. No, you do the part that's going to make you the happiest. D. Doing an exam is a psychological experience. So whatever makes you feel happy and confident, do that first. Do not do something that's going to depress you at the start of an exam. For most people, that'll be do A first. Maybe you should ration out the questions from A. Yeah, you ration them out. Whenever you're feeling down, go back and do another question from A. <laughs> I suggest you start at the beginning and go through. A is the general stuff and it's got writing and so on and so on. B is what I call easy programming questions. C is intermediate programming questions. D is impossibly hard programming questions. <laughs> now, here's my plan with the exam. I reckon most students, unless you're going for a distinction or a high distinction, most students I've found in the past score very poorly on the impossibly hard questions. And the impossibly hard questions are really there so I can, when I'm looking at two students and I'm trying to work out if one should get an HD or not, or if I'm trying to work out if they should get 96 or 97, or, you know, so this is giving me information about the very, very top end of the course, which probably isn't you, because they're the people that have no life and you've probably got a life. So, <laughs> so the, for most people, actually, in the exam, most people don't end up answering these questions. So you could even decide before you go into the exam how seriously you're going to take these questions. If you don't answer them, then the exam's out of 90. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that? You can still get an HD. You can still get an HD uh, with a quite a relatively low mark in the exam because it's only 50% of your assessment. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so you certainly want to do A, B, and C, uh, and then D you think about. So it goes harder and harder and harder as you go through. Someone that has troubles with B is probably not... Is, that's where I'm looking to see if you should pass the course or not. C is telling me if you should be getting a credit or maybe a distinction. And D is telling me if maybe you should be getting a distinction or a high distinction. Yep. Show us D. Show us D. Yeah, we'll get to D. So, this is, what, what part are we here? B. This is B. See, it's sort of easy. Gen a new pile of decks. That was from their assignment that year. Here, here's an easy one. Uh, so, exam questions can come from assignments, lectures, labs and shoots. They can actually come literally ripped out of previous lectures, labs, shoots or assignment. So, I, so make sure you do all the labs and shoots. This question is an easy one. Reads a number and prints out some numbers and it just skips some factors. Yeah? Do we have calculators? I can't remember. Look on the exam instructions when you see. Probably not. Do you have a strong reason for wanting a calculator? 
Because if you really want it, then you're encouraging me to put a question in that needs a calculator. <laughs> Whereas if I say no calculators, that means I can't put any questions in that require you to be able to do much more than doubling. <laughs> no calculators it is. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's look at part... <laughs> That's right, you write out the code. I don't know the answer, but here's what, what, here's what Pearl would tell me. All right, part, <laughs> part C. Shh, shh. Here's the hard programming questions. Now notice the instructions for part C, because they're interesting. Does that make sense? Not the question, I want you to look at the instructions. I discovered when I was marking that I was spending most of my time marking what I call plausible rubbish. Either a student writes down the answer and it's correct and they get full marks, boom, move on. Or they make a known mistake and after a while you get to know all the, you know, the range of most of the mistakes people can make. So you go, oh, subtract one mark or whatever, mark, you're on. But sometimes the student has no idea what to do. And then they just write rubbish down. Because they're thinking, if I write rubbish, I might get a sympathy mark. <laughs> and my, this kills me as a marker, because as a marker, you go, oh, no, it's rubbish. And then you think, but it might not be. They might be brilliant and weird. You know, so you're going, oh, man, I've got to follow this. What is this doing? And then you type it into your computer to try it out, because it's just so crazy, and it's got a compile error. But I don't want to fail you for compile errors, because, you know, you know, so I'm quite generous with compile errors. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe they meant to say this, and, you know, ah, ah, ah. And I, uh, bizarrely enough, at the end of marking, I was spending all my time dealing with... And at the end, you just go, I don't get it, but it looks like a tree. I'll give him a mark. Yeah, move on. That's what we call a sympathy mark. You know that. I know that. And if you write plausible rubbish, your marker will give you a sympathy mark. There's no incentive for you to write nothing for a question if you don't know the answer, because you can write rubbish and get a sympathy mark. And it only takes one second to write a bit of rubbish. But the devastating effect is it ruins the marking. Because I spend all my time looking at this rather than the beautiful solutions by the people that really understand the problem and, and but they've made a small mistake and I've got to work out how small the mistake is and things like that. So what we've got now is if you want a sympathy mark, for heaven's sake, don't write plausible rubbish, just write, I want a sympathy mark. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll give you a sympathy mark. Yeah, that's it. So what you do is you go to the front of the booklet. It even saves me transposing it to the front of the booklet. On the front of the booklet, next to the question, you just write one in the column of marks. And that is a sympathy mark, and you can have that mark. Does that make sense? But if you give yourself a sympathy mark, I won't mark anything you write for that question. So if you then change your mind and want to answer it, make sure you rub the sympathy mark out. Does that make sense? Now, the advantage of that is as I'm marking, I often hit a long run of one, oh, good, one, oh, good, one, oh, good. And I think oh, in two minutes, I've gone through 20 ones. And I think that would have been a day before. So that's absolutely fantastic for me. Now, what that means is it makes the marker's job easy because now when they're marking, if something doesn't work and it looks like plausible rubbish, how much do they give it? Zero. There's no sympathy marking in the marking there. So essentially, the marker has a marking scale that starts with two and goes up. So unless, you, unless your code's sort of right and working, it's a zero. So there's no point in writing plausible rubbish because you'll get zero. Does that make sense? This mainly applies for part D, of course, because you'll probably all be able to do part B and most of part C. But in part D, there's some really hard questions. So just go one, one. There'll probably be two questions. You can get two marks for part D. Sometimes people spend an hour answering part D and get zero. Writing pages and pages of stuff. And you've got two marks in one second. So in this whole exam, there'll be something like 25 questions plus two marks for following instructions. You can like get 27 marks in one second. Right? So if you get less than 27 marks in the exam, you, you've got to take a good, long, hard look at yourself. Yes? It's just like a couple of really minor syntax. No, syntax errors isn't plausible rubbish. No, if you know how to answer the question, he's worried, what do we, when do we start being ruthless and putting the zero? No, no, we're really generous. So if you know anything, if we ask you to write a program to, do, to uh, print out a tree, and your program has the right sort of shape, but the type definition's a bit wrong, and the loop bounds are a bit wrong, and this is a bit wrong, but it's sort of printing out a tree, oh, you might, you know, there'll be some marking guide and you'll get some marks. But if you just start writing star malloc equals and just write rubbish and you don't know anything and you're just guessing, then you won't get the mark. Does that make sense? So we're not at all mean. We're incredibly generous and that's really what was taking us so much time when we were marking before because our compassionate natures wouldn't let us give zero to someone that might possibly be right. So we'd agonise for hours over it. Yes? 
Does that mean for any one mark question in the exam, you should just get the sympathy mark and not bother Ah, well, uh, good question. Does this apply to all questions in the exam? No, only when it's in the instructions. So you'll find it's only in some parts does this apply for. What would happen if you gave yourself one mark in a part that didn't say you could do that? You'd lose two marks. You'd lose two marks. <laughs> and you wouldn't get any marks for that question. <laughs> yeah. What happens? Some people think it's very funny to write two. <laughs> but what happens if you write two? You lose two marks for not following instructions not and right, you don't get zero. No, no. But you don't, and you get zero for that question. One plus plus. Yeah, one plus. <laughs> so. <laughs> He's tricking us. He's going to do like a buffer overflow attack on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, man, you got a hundred. I didn't even mean that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, when your question overflows onto the marking, uh, <laughs> marking box. Okay, so that's, so that's really the special things I wanted to point out. I wanted to point out, if you don't know how to answer a question, then just write one and move on. If you do know how to answer a question, of course, try and answer it, and we will mark you uh, generously, generously and compassionately and put enormous effort in trying to find the right mark. Expect that you should be able to do all of Part D and most of Part B, part B and most of Part C, and that there is a Part D. And in Part D, we're asking extremely hard questions, and we're really only interested in the HD students. So look at those questions, attempt them if you wish, but we mark them much more strictly. We're really only attending some students to apply, uh, try those. But uh, actually, each year people uh, uh, attempt them and do magnificently well that we wouldn't have expected based on their lab marks. So, don't, so here's Part D. Look at the rules for Part D. You'll notice they're a bit tougher. So if you see it, a Part D one has to be worth at least 50% to get any marks. So it's not even, I don't know how to do this, but I know how to get started on it. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know how to do this, but I know how to get started. That's fine for the whole exam up until Part D. But in Part D, we only really want to see if you know how to do it. But if you know how to do it, yeah, do it. Actually, give it a shot. That's fantastic. Well done. But if you don't know how to do it, one. Uh, here are some, here are the two. Well, I don't really have to show you these now because they're on the web. This is sort of wasting lecture time. Isn't it? It's this complicated stuff about rings and stuff. Okay. What's that? Did we learn rings? We talked about rings and your surface, yeah. Are they Linked lists are examinable. So the idea of a linked list with the end point joining background to the beginning is examinable certainly in a part D, though it would be mean of me to put it in a part B or C. You're supposed to be able to apply anything we've taught you, especially in a part B. But I wouldn't expect in part D. Now let's just go back because I really wanted to go over the specifics of the exam. We've seen the rules, which are really important to get right because it saddens me, but every year there are students who don't answer a question and don't give themselves one mark. So the one mark actually turns out to mean something, bizarrely enough. Do you know what I mean? They leave a question blank and they don't give themselves a sympathy mark. What are they thinking? They don't, yeah, I don't know why. Okay, so uh, here's my rough breakdown of the exam. It seems to be about 60% of the marks are just basic C programming of one sort or another. About 20% of the marks are something to do with machine code in one form or another. And by subtraction, though, of course, everything overlaps and some questions are about both and so on. About 20% are about neither, so they could be asking you to define something. What, what does INFS stand for or something like that? That, that sort of question. We love questions like that. Um, Things, shh, 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 shh. Here are, and then I flipped through the exam, then I looked at the topics that were covered. Memory use, so that you know about the different types, that you know how the types are stored, except you don't have to know how a floating point number is stored, but you know how arrays are stored and ints are stored and so on. You know about binary and hexadecimal. You know about the difference between bits and bytes. And you know about memory allocation, that, um, Things declared in functions are on the stack. Things declared with malloc are on the heap. And the code itself lives in the code segment up the top. Now, as I go through looking at all these topics, you should know most of them. Some of them you won't know. Don't freak out. I'm telling you now, two weeks out of the exam, so you can flip through the lecture notes and work them out. And if they don't make sense, ask on the forum. And if they still don't make sense, come along to the revision day and ask me, and I'll explain anything you need to know. So it's not time for panicking. It's just time for pointing it out. There'll be questions about style. Question about frames used to communicate with functions. Questions about stacks, queues, and trees. Questions about functions, how to define them. And remember we talked a bit about advantages and disadvantages of functions, like the whole point of having functions. Questions about abstractions, because I just love abstraction. 
Let's go back. Oh, actually, while we're there, let's make the notes. No, no. Questions about ADTs? Basically, do you know what an ADT is? Do you know how to define an ADT? Questions about pointers? Questions about linked lists? Questions about binary search? Questions about insertion sort? Questions about common errors? Questions involving arrays? Questions involving strings? Questions involving structs? And I couldn't see anything else, but if you ask me something, is this in the exam or not, then I'll be able to tell you yes or no. Oh, I can't strictly say yes or no. I can certainly say no if it's not. But some questions I've got down, marked down to be in the exam, when I actually type the thing up, will probably fall out of the exam. So uh, I might say, yes, something's in the exam, and it might turn out to fall out. But I can give you a rough idea. So are there any questions you've got about what's in and what's not? Yes? When did we do hex? Like, I know what it is. Hex, when, when did we do hex? Uh, we talked about it early on, week two or three or something. Week two? Yeah. two. Uh, what operations? Just conversion? What opera oh, yeah, you just got to know sort of how they work. So if I gave you a number in one and asked you to convert it to another, or if I gave you a number in hex and wanted you to write out what bits it was, or if I wanted to ask you what's the biggest hexadecimal number that could fit in an int, or, you know, just, just basically that you're able to deal with all the different ones. Yeah. Yes? Shh, shh. You need to know insertion sort. Well, how do we talk about it? We talked about it with linked lists and with arrays, so you should know both. Yeah, we talked about it for arrays. Yeah, we did that in, a, in the first lecture on, we did on data, data structures. Yeah. Oh yeah, good question, thank you. Transistors. Um, you, you do not need to uh, know how to put gates together to make stuff, but you'd, I think I did show you how to build a few things out of transistors, didn't I? I showed you how to build an AND gate, an OR gate, and a NOT gate, and a, a memory cell. You need to know that level of stuff. So I expect you to know how a transistor works as a switch and how you can join them together to make something very, very simple. Yeah. And how many marks could I put down for something like that? Yeah, not many. And what's the chance I'm going to put something like that in the exam? High. Pretty high. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can probably guess what's in the exam. More or less every different topic we've touched on, I'll try and put a question on. And if it's a minor thing, I'll try and make it worth not very much. And if it's a major thing, I'll make it pop up all the time. Transistors are a very minor thing. But yeah, we did it. Some people learnt them. There was a lab on them. So I'm expecting you to know a bit about them. And if you don't, ask your tutor, ask in the forum. And if it still doesn't make sense, ask me at the revision session. Yeah, more questions? Anyone want to know what's in the exam or not? Yes, Danny. Yes. When do the nice notes Oh, when will they get printed? I don't know. Um, it's it's going to take if. Uh, Hopefully by the revision thing. Either I could print them before the revision thing and we could hand them out at the revision thing, or I could print them like a day after the revision thing in case you want to update them as a result of the revision thing. Yeah. 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 The second one? You can access them online till the end. So why don't I try and print them out on the Tuesday? When's the exam? On the Friday. So I'll try and print them out. Um, I'll try and print them on the Wednesday. So maybe we'll say about halfway through Tuesday, certainly nothing will get in after that. Monday night will certainly get in. And maybe some stuff on Tuesday will get in too. Yes? No, we'll, I'll hand them out to you as you walk into the exam. Yeah, it'll be on the web. Yeah, yeah, it's on the web. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if we gave them to you before the exam, you could write stuff in them like, Richard's a fink. <laughs> and then when you got to those, you go, oh, hang on, I had that answer written somewhere here. Fink. <laughs> so, yes? Are going to lock it when you, uh, when, when you print it so that we can't change it? No. But if you want, I'll tell you when I'm printing it. So you can use revision history to go back or something. Uh, if you want me to lock it, I can. We can debate about that on the forum. I, I, I'm indifferent to whether we lock it or not. Of course, you're not doing the exam. Yeah, but you guys could take a mirror and take a copy, or you know, there's lots of. Yeah. Um, Joel. Oh yeah, the people that write notes for the revision session should come to the revision. Can you come to the revision? Are you in that too? Yeah. So come to that session and put that up in the nice notes for that. Yeah, that'll have to be included in the in the book too, won't it? Yeah. So do it really fast. Can you do it that night, maybe a Monday night? Yeah, you get access to my bullet points. Yep, yep. I'll click that at the end. Yeah, I just noticed that then actually. I was nearly undid it then, but I feel I like, figured I'll wait till we finish the lecture. Yep. Any more questions that want to know about people that want to know what's in the exam? Yes. You want? I'll be counting. I'll have a ruler there. <laughs> no. Um, 
you, you just have to write your code so it's clear in the exam. Write it clear. Yeah. You don't have to follow 72, but it's, in an exam, even 50 lines is quite, 50 characters is quite long. You might find, just to make it clear, you're actually forced to compress it more than you normally would. Because it's quite hard to write it out. But as long as it's clear, that's all I care about. Yeah, oh, it does have to comply with the style guide. Oh, let's make a ruling now. It doesn't have to follow the 72 character rule, but I can't conceive of it not following 72 character rule and still being clear. But if you can pull it off, then I won't punish you. Okay. I mean, we won't penalise you. Punish is this sort of paternal terminology, isn't it? You'll still get punished, but you won't be penalised. <laughs> yes? Oh, can you use different colour pens? Uh, yeah, if you want, but don't use the colour we'll be marking with. And we'll say that on the front, red or something. You can use blue and black, but don't, don't, certainly don't use a red or a, anything that's hard to read. Don't do that, because we read it under low light conditions. We'll be marking at 4 o'clock one morning with just a little overhead line on. We, we don't want faint writing or something. Yeah. Shiny pens with glitter. <laughs> if you use shiny pens with glitter, we actually have a gold star that we put on the exam paper. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, your, and your transcript. Yes, sorry, didn't see. Yes. Is there what? Is ethics in the exam? No. <laughs> Except that we don't want you to cheat. <laughs> no, don't use pencil. Write pencil in the rough booking, working booklet if you want. But it's actually really hard to read pencil and it smudges really easy. So after a bit of marking, it can actually be really hard to read your code. You can draw a line through it or draw an arrow or. Yeah, or, or most people draft the code in pencil in the rough working book if it's tricky code. Yeah, but no, don't use pencil. Thanks for asking that. There was one more question here. No, Max, last one. Yes. Oh well, this is the problem with pen and paper. Draw arrows. Just use your creativity to think of it. Yeah, do it however you can. Make it as clear as you can. I've, I've written a bad exam if you have to do a lot of writing of code. You know, if, if, if you have to write 50 or 60 lines to solve a function, for the last part, if I do it right, it's a question that involves a lot of thinking, but the number of lines of code won't be that much. Yeah. If I get it right. I could easily get it wrong. All right. So that's the exam. Is that a hand? Yes. Do you have to put? <laughs> oh, <do you laughs> Stop asking these questions. That's a good question. Do you have to write a comment block at the top with your name and the date? <laughs> no. Look, we're, we're marking the code generously and compassionately. What we're looking for is how clear it is. We're not as strict as a compiler, and we're not as strict as the style guide. So minor infractions are fine. Shh, shh, shh. But. If you're doing something weird and crazy in your code and you don't comment it, then the marker might go, uh, I don't get it. But if it's evident, do you need to make a comment like you would in your normal code or can you leave it out? Your code should just be clear. Your code should always be clear. It should be just like the code you always write. It should be clear. You, you shouldn't have extraneous comments in your code. You want to convince, you want the marker to understand what you're doing and they've got a finite amount of time to mark it. So, so it's in your interest to put some comments in, but you've got to find out amount of time to write the answer. So don't, don't write a stupid number of comments in. Is that, is that helpful? What about, um, here's what we could do. All right, here's what I propose. Someone writes some code. We'll pick one of the questions in that exam. I don't care which one it is. And everyone write a solution to that. And I will go through and mark them, as I would mark them if they're an exam thing. And you can see, I'll say too many comments not enough, or something like that. So, Let's pick it on the forum rather than wasting time now. We'll pick a sample question from a past exam, and as many people as want write solutions, we'll publish them all, and I'll mark each solution. What do you think of that? Yes? I was just wondering, if you make mistakes in pen, would you rather like scribble them out or bring some white out of something in Don't mind. Whatever makes you happier. Yeah. The question is, uh, white out or um, scribbling out? I don't mind. I really don't mind. It, you know what I want the most is, shh, shh. What I want the most is you to have the ability to express what you've learned and what you can do. And if it's messy and cluttered and everything like that, that's a small problem. It's not a big problem. What I want to see is what you can do. So 
I, I don't want to create this I thought in your, your worry in your mind now that you're worried about making everything obsessively neat. And, you know, because, you know, it's not worth that much to be obsessively neat. I think it's my instructions like right. Yeah. If you can get the answer down, that's fantastic. If you get it down with scribbles, that's still fantastic. If you get it down and we can't work out what the hell's going on, that's not so fantastic. Yeah, yeah. If it's with, if it's with white out, it makes it easier for us to mark, but it doesn't affect your mark at all. Yeah. And you know how annoying it is while you're waiting for that to dry. Yeah, yeah. Um, teamwork. This is the last content of the course. Teamwork. I was at a brownie troop the other day stealing their potato badge. <laughs> and I was watching the little girls. You said you found it. Shh, what's that? You said you found it. I said I found it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they had to do an exercise where they had to assemble balloons and make it as big as possible. They had black balloons, a whole lot of balloons. They had to blot themselves in some sticky tape. And they had to make a self supporting structure as tall as it could be. They had five minutes to do it. They were not allowed to sticky tape it to the floor. So there had to be some sort of base and things. Okay, it's like an engineering problem. It was very exciting for me to watch it. Go, she said. All the kids rushing around trying to blow up balloons. They're, they're in patrols. They're little patrol leaders. They're all like eight or nine year old, or some of the six. And there's a couple of 14 and 15 year old girls who are older in their own little group off the side. They're, um, they're in patrols and they've got a patrol leader who's supposed to be looking after the group. And the groups are about five or six kids each. They don't know each other and they're all more or less the same age. They know each other only through brownies. You know, they're not like lifelong friends or anything like that. And I was just watching and it was fascinating to watch. In one group in particular, there was a really smart girl who knew what she was doing, who could blow up balloons really quickly and who was a patrol leader. And she understood about the weight to ratio, height, you know, the ratio of, she understood all that stuff. And, she, and what she was doing, I was, I was watching, was she was blowing up balloons, tying them, saying, we need 16, she's blowing it up, getting the sticky tape. And the other girls were coming up trying to do stuff and doing hopeless jobs and she's saying, go away, go away. And after a while, the whole, her whole group was just sitting down sort of sadly watching her as she was frantically trying to assemble this thing that she knew in her mind exactly how to build. Then next to her was a group uh, where there was a more laissez-faire sort of leader and they were all just laughing and giggling and sticking things together and no one really knew what was going on. And they were just having fun. And the leader was just being amiable and letting everyone have a turn and things like that. And then there was another group that I wasn't watching. And then there was the 15 year old girls. And they knew exactly what to do and they were operating like a well-oiled machine. And they built this sort of like, this pyramid that was like as tall as them. And it was absolutely fantastic and beautiful and structured. How do you think the other two teams went though? The laissez-faire team built one that was nearly as tall. I don't know how they did it, and it was sort of half leaning over, but when it started to fall over, one just taped an extra bit in the bottom, and they're all dealing on it, and it was loppy and lopsided, but it was actually nearly as tall as the girls. The really obsessive girl that knew what she was doing, and I thought would build the best one, her one was like, like one or two layers high. And it was beautiful and neat, but it was just, and her troop had a miserable time. And I thought, oh my God, I wish my whole course was here watching that. This is a classic example that we all fall into, and I bet you've done it with your group work. I know everything. I'm the best in the group. Everyone else, go away. I will do it all. It will be perfect. Leave me alone. We can't operate like that. I know you're all tempted to do that, but you can't do it. It doesn't work. With everyone working together, even if they're incompetent and idiots, the sheer weight of numbers of people helping you and having different ideas and just pitching in massively outweighs any advantage you have in being 50 million times better than everyone else. Unless it crashes at unpredictable moments. Unless it crashes at unpredictable moments. Well, it didn't. Didn't. The, their objective, they had one specific objective. And, and, and yeah. I, I'm not trying to talk about a specific thing now. You're going to tell me specific problems. And my answer as a teacher was always, well, that's your problem. <laughs> what I'm going to say is a group working even reasonably well can outperform any individual, no matter how good that individual is. What you want to do, if you're a high-performing individual, is work out how the hell you can be a high-performing individual in a group that's effective. And if you can sort that out, your power to do things is multiplied a million-fold. I think the danger is we all want to be lone cowboys. And in the end, being a lone cowboy, you can only go so far. It'll be brilliant where you can go, but eventually you'll have to stop. And if you could be in a team that works, you can go so much further. So yeah, there's this problem, and there's this problem, and there's this problem, and there's this problem. That's right. That's leadership. Solve those problems. I don't know how to solve them, but you've got to solve them somehow. My theory with all learning is there are some things you're good at and some things you're not good at. And if you're a good scholar, what are you working at? The things you're not good at. You're probably good at programming and not good at teamwork. So heaven's sake, put that great brain of yours into thinking how to make teamwork work. 
If you're really good at being on time and not good at being relaxed, work harder at being relaxed and late. If you're good at being this and that and not good at that, work hard. Just find the fight left-handed. Always pick the challenge and do the thing you can't do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's week one in 60 seconds. Are you ready? Week one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the course. Oh, by the way, you should all watch week one again if you have a chance, the first lecture, and see how, if it was true or not, because we made a whole lot of predictions and said what the course is about. Go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the course. You're going to enjoy this course. I hope you're going to enjoy this course. But it's going to be a lot of hard work. And you're going to go through a lot of pain and suffering and pain and suffering and pain and pain and pain and pain and suffering. But it's a lot of hard work. Sucked in. <laughs> but the reason you're here, hopefully, is because you want to learn something. And our aim is at the end of the course, you will have learned something. And you will have gone through a lot of pain, but you will have changed. And you will have got some skills that you will be proud of. And you will be able to go on applying these skills and do cool things with them. I love computing. Here's why I love computing. Three reasons. Reason number one, you get to make stuff. I love making stuff. It's really fun. You can show it to your mom. You feel proud of it. It's beautiful. <laughs> making things gives me a warm inner glow. Computing, you can make stuff like crazy. Number two, you get to think and solve problems. I love thinking. I love solving problems. It's like a new puzzle every 10 minutes. It's annoying sometimes, but it's thinking and solving puzzles. It's fantastic. So you get to be an engineer and you get to be a scientist. And number three, the third reason I like computing, is you get to help people. Because by using this amazing tool called the computer, you can solve problems. And the world has heaps more problems than it has solutions. And you can find a whole lot of new ones with a computer that's so powerful and as yet so untapped. That's why I like computing. I hope you like it for the same reason. That was week one. Then I said, last year's batch, I always ask the students what advice they'd offer to the next year. Do you remember the advice last year's guys offered? Start, Start your assignments early. What do you, what, guys, this is your one chance, and now we have a proper video that we're not going to lose. If you could offer one piece of advice, if you could go back in time and speak to McFly, what would you tell him? Start your assignments early. Start your assignments early. <laughs> what would you do? What would it be? Buy more potatoes. Buy more potatoes. <laughs> That corner of the potato market. Practice, practice, practice. Practice, practice, practice. What would it be? What do you think practice? Uh, what did you not do yourself that you wished you had done? Unit if you had your time again, what could you do again? Unit test before you start. Lab exercises, even if you don't finish them on time, do them anyway. Do right. labs even if you don't finish them? Who thinks that? Yes. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Write your test first. <laughs> How many times did we say that? I don't even do it all the time. <laughs> but when you don't do it, don't you suffer? All right, let me tell you a story about not doing the test first. If you do the test as you go, it's fantastic. If you wait till the end and then you do the test, you can be in trouble. I did an economics degree because I love maths and I wanted to be an actuary because someone told me actuaries did stuff to do with maths. And then I went and worked as an actuary for years and years and I qualified as an actuary for years and years. And then I was a very high paid actuary for years and years and years. And it was like my 10 year high school reunion before I met someone and they said, what are you doing again? And I said, actuary, it's like financial mathematics and stuff. And they said, oh. That's a bit disappointing. I, I always sort of thought you'd do something more interesting than that. And I said, no, it is interesting because, uh, oh. <laughs> it's really sad. And then I thought, and I thought long and hard about my life. I thought, what am I doing? I'm not doing something that's making me happy. I should do something that makes me happy. I applied a test, but it was 10 years. It was like, if I wanted to work out what I was going to do at age 30, when should I have been testing that? 20. Constantly, all the time. But I got to some point without asking questions and I asked a question and realized I made a mistake. So you guys should be doing XP to your life as well. You should be doing the tests all the time. You should be thinking, am I in the right degree? Have I got the right friends? Am I treating my family the right way? Am I doing this right? And constantly questioning and testing and testing and testing and testing and testing. You don't want to get to some point and think, oh, why didn't I ask myself this question 10 years ago? Okay, so yes, who thinks testing at the beginning? Yes, who thinks do the lab exercises even if you don't have to? Oh, yes. Oh, we've got about 50-50. Is there anything else? Who thinks start the assignments earlier? Brownie points are important. <laughs> Brownie, Brownie points are important. <laughs> nice one, Roy. <laughs> Buy more potatoes. OK, well, let's have two pieces of advice. Can, so can the people who think you should start the lab exercise early just shout out loudly to the camera, hey, guys, hello in the future. Can you hello. say it? Go. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> how about I say it and you go, yeah, baby. And Austin Powell sort of way. So here we go. I wish I had done all the lab exercises. And even if I hadn't got them finished, I wish I kept working on them and eventually finished them. Yeah. Cool. 
And the other one was, Richard always told me to test at the beginning and test throughout, but I tested not until the end, and now I am sad. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. No, uh, that's a happy way of putting that. Uh, uh, I, yeah. This, I, um, although I have gone through a wonderful experience learning about testing, had I known how important it was to test all the way through, I would have done so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll snip that footage out and stick it somewhere. All right. Uh, how long have we got? We've got like uh, seven minutes, five minutes. All right, what comes next? What comes next is you've now learned how to be a computing craftsman, the craftsmanship of programming. What comes next is 1927, where you learn the science of computer programming and you learn how to be a computer scientist. And then what comes after that is the beautiful one where you learn the design aspect and how to be a designer and an architect of computing. That's what comes next, 2911. What comes next in the long term? Well, you're going to live this long life and be really happy. And my advice, as always, is think carefully about what you're doing and don't spend all your time thinking about the little immediate problems which might be urgent, but instead make sure you think about the big long-term things which might not be urgent, or you might end up answering the wrong question. So my advice, I guess, is test, test, test all the way through. That's my fatherly advice. Some people have been talking about money. And they've been saying, oh, I want to do this job because it gets lots of money and I do this, this, this. And money is a funny thing, and let me say as a person that was for a while very wealthy and is now not very wealthy, <laughs> that when I was very wealthy, I was not very happy. And now I'm not very wealthy, I am happy. And if I had to trade the balance, which I did have to do, and it's a constant decision, constant conscious decision between money and happiness, it's just such a no-brainer. Of course, it would be nice to have both. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it sort of seems almost mutually exclusive in this world. I don't know why. So happiness is great. And then I had this last thing to say. Where is it? Oh, do we have time? The erotic kiss. I don't know. Shall I tell you? Have we got time? <laughs> All right. Shh, shh. Okay, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. The strange case of the erotic kiss is this. When I was a boy, I had glandular fever. <laughs> and as glandular fever, you can't kiss anyone because it's highly contagious through kissing. And I had a girlfriend and I loved her deeply and passionately and very erotically. And she loved me deeply and passionately and very erotically and we couldn't kiss. And for something, some stupid period of time, does anyone know how long it is? It was certainly months. Three months, was it? Something like that. For three, for I was sucked in Richard. For three months, we couldn't kiss. And I spent that whole three months thinking how much I really, really wanted to kiss her and how nice kissing was, and how important kissing was, and how kissing was fantastic. And as it drew closer and closer to that red letter day in the calendar where we'd be allowed to kiss again, we planned that we would have the world's biggest kiss. <laughs> and that we would kiss and not stop kissing for an hour. And we would not be allowed to stop, we would just kiss and kiss and kiss, and there would be no coming up for breath or anything. It would be the world's most spectacular kiss. And that day came, and we were very excited, and we got into our special kissing position, and bang, we started kissing. <laughs> and it went on and on and on. It was fantastic. It was so good. And then after a while, it was just a bit weird. <laughs> I started thinking, oh, well, I'm next to another human being, and they're rubbing their digestive organs over my digestive organs. <laughs> my lips are going a bit numb. And is that dribble I feel down there? And oh, oh, this is disgusting. And after about maybe half an hour, <laughs> We both pulled away saying, ah! <laughs> and I, th I, think, I think this parable, this story is just <laughs> that sometimes you think you know what you want, but be careful that you actually do go after what you really want. Because sometimes what looks like the fantastic thing, when you look at it more closely, is disgusting. <laughs> okay, so I'll see you in a couple of years. Okay, guys, see you, bye. Oh, and another revision. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I enjoyed it completely. It was fantastic. Well done to you.
Okay. Thank you. Oh, oh, and this is for Alex. If anyone wants to write something on Alex's thing, please do. Oh, do you want me to tell everyone what the name? No, let's leave that as a surprise. They'll find it. They'll find it. If you want to write on Alex's shirt, please do so. For Alex North. Yeah. Oh, fantastic.